And I'm looking forward to our conversation with our guests today, Dr. Sandra Bond Chapman and Dr. Jeff Ling. Dr. Chapman founded the Center for Brain Health, a research institute at the University of Texas at Dallas, where she also serves as a D. Wiley Distinguished Professor in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. Dr. Ling is a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and anesthesiology and critical care medicine at Johns Hopkins University and the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences and an attending neurocritical care physician at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Chapman and Dr. Ling, welcome to the Next Steps Forward. Thank Great. you. Great to be here. Thanks Great so much for your time. You, yes. Great to see you, Sandy. Because we're gonna be talking about brain health a lot during the next 54 minutes, let's start with a definition of brain health. Dr. Chapman, why don't you go first, and then Dr. Ling. Thank you, Chris. You know, brain health is an interesting concept Right now, I think conventionally, it's been defined more in terms of lack of injury and disease. We really haven't defined brain health. Uh, so that's really what we're doing is defining what is it? What does it mean to have good brain health? And for us, brain health means using the brain skills that you've got to thrive in your context. So using your brain skills, what does that mean? Everyone can think critically, solve the problems that face them, engage socially, solve innovative problems, and be able to endure emotional stress. That's what brain health, and how can we build more capacity in that area? And so for us, we're trying to really kind of shift the script that, and define brain health in health. Dr. Ling? Yeah, I think that that's really a seminal question, Chris. And as Dr. Chapman had pointed out, the exact definition of a Webster's Dictionary, in fact, uh, you won't really find one yet. It's evolving. Uh, it's really good to have Sandy on because she actually is a pioneer of this concept. I mean, she started developing this uh, line of investigative scientific inquiry and also this concept back in the late 90s when she was uh, still in elementary school. So, um, but the, uh, but all kidding aside, uh, it is actually a very important question and indeed of the seminal question. As a physician, I would say that good brain health is the absence of disease, but that's not the same thing as brain health. Health is actually the state that you are physiologically, anatomically, and so on, right? That's a state of being. Good health would, could be conceived of as an absence of disease, and bad health could conceivably be in the presence of disease. But that's a binary answer. Yes, no, black, white. And it's really not, uh, um, uh, when we're having this discussion, we want to get beyond the binary uh, um, uh, uh, response and really come down to the nuanced one. And the nuanced one is, what does it mean to you? So, Chris, I'm an old and broken down, fat, ugly army, ex-army colonel. And so <laughs> what does good health mean to me? It means I got out of bed in the morning. I mean, you know, so, um, and that for you being young, handsome and vibrant, you would say, no, Jeff, my response of good health is that I'm able to go on a 10 mile hike with my dog and then go skiing in the afternoon. So health is really, I think, divine individually. It means that you're able to do the things that you want to do at the capacity that you uh, feel that you are really capable of. And so health uh, and brain health, uh, as Sandy has pointed out, and that would include cognitive things, mental health things, and so on and so forth. So this is an evolving science, but really it is a, it's a critical one. It's one that actually needs to evolve. It needs to become part of our natural daily lexicon. Very similar to is if I looked at you and said, are you in good health, uh, Chris Meek? And you would say, uh, funny you should ask. Yes, I am, doc. Um, I really don't need to be here or no doc. I need to be here because you know, I have a twinge in my back or some other thing like that. So it's, so that's why my answer is a little more long winded than perhaps you had anticipated. <laughs> well, I appreciate the kind words about being young. I'm not as young as you think. And my wife now, now finds herself quoting the entertainer Pitbull or any day above grounds, a good day. That's, right. that's exactly so, right. And Jeff, you say that we can find, uh, we can't find a definition for brain health in the dictionary, but we can find Google. Uh, so we have to change this, Sandy. We have to do some work here. So Sandy, you and Jeff are both doctors, but your work with brain focuses on cognitive side and Jeff's work is focused on medical aspects such as function. Would you explain for a layperson what those differences mean, not only for your work, but for the patients you work with? 
Yeah, do you want Jeff uh, do you want, want to take uh, it first? Uh, do you want me to go first or second? That's where they start <laughs> is with the doctor. And we're like, no, come to us first. <laughs> and, all right, so um, uh, on this, I would say that uh, the medical aspects of um, brain health are, or, uh, is really comes down to, I am a neurologist, of course. And so when I look at the medical aspects, um, I'm actually looking at pathology. Um, having a dementia, for example, is meaning loss of cognitive function. Um, having epilepsy means that you actually have excessive function, but in a pathological way. Um, if you look at a stroke, for example, that is a, a loss of function due to a vascular reason. So uh, for me, health is really what's the state of the brain in the context of the rest of the body. Uh, and so really my job is to take care of patients when they know when they, when something is wrong, Chris. When something is wrong, uh, and the and the concept of good brain health is really what we're talking about. When we're talking about brain health, you really are talking about good brain health is that you don't need to see me, the doctor, and that's the whole point of this discussion. What can what can we do to forestall the need to see me, the doctor? And relevant to this discussion, there are some things that are taken as inexorable truths. One of the inexorable truths is that we're all going to get dementia ultimately. And that's, of course, a terrifying thought. And we want to dispel that. That is not an inexorable truth. All right. And, that, and I'm going to turn it over to Sandy so she can, uh, you know, develop that notion a little bit further. Yeah. And I would say I thank you, Jeff. You know, what's so ex interesting to me, Chris, is you, know, you think about brain health, our brain is our most important asset that we have that drives us, that makes us who we are, uh, that sets vision to have fun, to laugh, to plan vacations. But why is it that we, we have so much stigma around it? It's because we have continued to look at this organ as something that I don't wanna know about it because you're only gonna give me bad news. And I sometimes tell people that I'm an accidental futurist um, because early in my career, before I even got my PhD, I, I was a great diagnostician. I could die. I was in the public schools and we had measures I could diagnose kids with on the autism spectrum, kids with dyslexia, learning problems, you know, all sorts of things, brain injury, concussion. And I realized that our definitions diagnoses didn't make them better. And so I started a classroom for individuals and saw that they could achieve way beyond what I had learned was possible. And I thought, man, we don't know squat about the brain and its upward potential. And so that's why when I ended up going back to get my PhD to study cognitive neuroscience. And so our big goal is to define, take neuroplasticity, the rigorous science that your brain changes moment by moment by everything you do in good ways and bad ways. And if you are the architect of making your brain stronger, don't you want to know how to do that? Instead of thinking, oh my gosh, what bad news. They're going to tell me I don't have a brain or, you know, how I'm, my IQ is low. But what if it's today, don't you want to be better tomorrow? So what we say with brain health, we're using the science of neuroplasticity to show the measures of a brain getting stronger, faster, more efficient, to help you solve problems quicker. And now we can begin to measure that. So to get people excited about being you, but better next year, regardless of what age you start, whether it's 10, 20, 40, or 80. Now let's talk about where each of you do your work. Sandy, please describe the Center for Brain Health at the University of Texas at Dallas. When was it founded? What was the impetus? And what it does and how does it evolve over time? Yeah, so Chris, you'll get a, a laugh out of this. The, 20 years ago, when I was, you know, knocking on my dean's door saying, you know, I want to start this center because we don't really have anything in the country or the world that's looking at the brain and health needs like, Sandy, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but it ended up that he finally said, yes, go ahead. Brain health was so new in 1999, we got a trademark on it because people weren't defining it in brain health. So when he said, yes, get started, we started raising money to do the rigorous science um, starting. And, you know, because we were defining 
the brain in injury and disease, actually, we started with looking at kids with concussion and people with learning problems and seeing after they have a diagnosis, can we take them further than anything that we ever knew was possible? So that's actually where we started. But in the last 15 years, we realized, hey, why not start working with healthy people? Um, so we started with middle schoolers and emerging adults and 40 year olds and even people late into life. And we've shown with the Center for Brain Health through rigorous science, um, randomized trials that there's, regardless of your starting point, if you learn tactical brain strategies of how to use this engine, it's almost like if you have a fancy car and you don't know how to use it or your phone, you don't use the apps in it. But, and so we don't really know how to use this engine efficiently. So a lot of the things we're doing, so that's, that's what the Center for Brain Health is driven by the rigor science. We grew from a team of 25 to 150 scientists, research clinicians, and now we want to take the translation of the science to help people, regardless of where they are, to reach their fullest brain potential. And for those listeners and viewers who haven't been there, I've visited Sandy a number of times and the facility is absolutely spectacular, state of the art. Uh, highly encourage you to, to reach out and get involved. So I'll keep plugging that for you, Sandy. We want to help everybody. 7.8 no. billion people. Incredible. Incredible. Jeff, you serve as co-leader of the Jean Ann Brock Brain Health Project. What is the Brain Health Project? And the same question, when it was founded, what was the impetus, and what are its goals, and how has it evolved over time? Well, the um, Brain Health Project itself is really a, um, a multi-institutional, uh, multi-country uh, study of our projected goal of 100,000 people uh, who, where we can actually identify those uh, elements of their life that are impactful on uh, their brain health in a good way. What are those things that negatively impact the brain health? What are the things that positively impact the brain health? And what can each individual do along the way? It's very similar conceptually, conceptually to, to a study that was done long time ago called the Framingham Heart Study. The Framingham Heart Study was actually founded in the 1940s. And what it set out to do was to also look at something that was thought to be an inexorable des des uh, uh, destiny-driven uh, outcome of, of men, really. And that was getting a heart attack. Uh, in the 40s, of course, you know, everybody who was, every male about the age of 50, it was a question about when you, uh, whether or not you're gonna get a heart attack, but when was your first heart attack? And of course, when was your fatal heart attack, right? And uh, so, the, so really, the, uh, some remarkable investigators up in Boston, out of, uh, in collaboration with Boston University, actually did this study called the Framingham Heart Study, where they actually went to the town of Framingham, and they studied you know, a few thousand uh, men, because it was done in the 40s, uh, and they went uh, and did this remarkable study where they were looking for exactly the same things that the Brain Health Project is doing, but for heart. What are those elements of one that, um, that negatively impact heart health and one of the positive things that uh, impact heart health. And I wanna be clear here, this is not a medical study in the strictest sense. Nobody's getting a drug, nobody's getting surgery. It was really what are the things that are important. And of course they discovered a, a number of things that came about. Blood pressure was important, blood glucose was important, i.e. diabetes. Uh, your weight was important. Did you smoke cigarettes, for example? Um, uh, did you drink alcohol, for example? Um, did you exercise regularly? And, uh, and, and uh, there were some other things that they found that uh, were impactful, but it's nothing to do about it, such as being male and over the age of 55 years old. All that stuff was done. It was identified. Um, it took them 10 years to do it. And then, of course, they, they wrapped up all that information and they uh, worked with the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association, of course, created the Heart Healthy Program which they said, hey, all you people out there, you got to watch all these things we just talked about. And as the science evolved, much like Sa Sandy is doing, disciplined science done by multiple organizations. Now, they actually said, oh, it's more than blood pressure. It's a systolic blood pressure of 140. Oh, it's more than sugar. It's your hemoglobin A1C of seven and so on and so forth, right? And you should not smoke cigarettes. And by the way, alcohol actually has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it at all. Um, and exercise, you should get 20 minutes of good aerobic activities, blah, 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 blah. And then they rolled it out and notice again, no medicines, no surgeries, 
Now, granted, to make the blood pressure goals, you might need some medicines, but the reality is, is that if we took care of ourselves, you would reap the net benefit. Well, guess what? Lo and behold, what an impact. I'm sorry to my friends, the cardiologists and the cardiothoracic surgeons, but the biggest impact ain't you. It ain't you. It is the patients <laughs> grabbing control of their lives and controlling the things we had just talked about. And the beauty of it is, what does that mean? The average age in the 1930s and 1940s was about 58 years old. 58 years old, right? Now look at it. Upper 70s for men, lower 80s for women. That's an additional 30% of life, Chris, of life. And what can you do with that? And remarkable things with that. In fact, you might become president. Oh, boy. Right? So that is the net benefit of understanding what good cardiac health gives you. Now, of course, if we're going to live to our 90s, we want to be sure that we are functioning well. Well, that we're not, you know, in a nursing home, for example, you're out doing what you want to do. And I point out that for all of your listeners out there, you would agree that if you were in the 1960s or 1950s, you would be shocked, shocked to see a 70-year-old in the ski slopes, shocked to see an 80-year-old on the dance floor, shocked to see a, uh, um, um, a 70-year-old on the treadmill next to you. But are you shocked today? And the answer is no, of course not. No, of course not. That should be the same for your brain health. So what we're trying to do is do exactly that. It identify those things that are positive, those things that are negative. And we already have uh, data, by the way. We already have data. Not enough sleep, negative. Too many stressors, negative. Dense social network, positive, you know, and so on and so forth. So there are things that you can do. And is there an equivalent to aerobics for the brain? The short answer is yes. It's called smart training. And so there's many things that are evolving from the study that is going to make it so that you maintain a good, healthy brain in addition to the longevity you're benefiting by exercising regularly, not smoking, and on and on it goes. So it's no good to protect your body if you're not protecting your brain. That's the point of the Brain Health Project. And so as, and this data, by the way, is now using 20th, 21st century technology, not 1940s technology. Everybody has a phone, for example, right? In 1940s, you had to go down to the drugstore to find the phone. So Sandy uh, and Ian um, and, uh, and Tom and I are able to create a, this program, work on it together, that is going to reach out and touch 100,000 people, not just men, by the way, women, um, cross-cultural, um, including the LGBTIQ community, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, is that we're going to use this information, get it out as fast as possible. I mean, this is a university-run project. Get as fast as possible so people can start grabbing hold of the things that are positive and negative for their brain health and institute it into their lives. And that's what this whole project is all about. When did it get started? Just a couple of years ago. Of course, it got slowed down a little bit because of COVID. We all got that. But it's up and running and doing very well. And the first set of data has already come out, already come out. So we're really, really excited about this opportunity space. And again, it is to keep patients brain healthy. So they don't need to come to the neurologist. They don't need to go to the psychiatrist. They don't definitely don't want to go to the neurosurgeon. That ain't good. So you don't want to see any of us, right? You don't want to see any of us. You want to stay healthy as long as you can. And brain healthy is absolutely, if you don't have brain health, you don't have good health, period. Right, Sandy? That's it. And I love it when Jeff talks about left a boom, you know, because we, we don't realize that we are the architects of our own brain. And most people say, yeah, I want to live long, but I don't want to live long if I don't have my brain with me. And right now, while we've done so much to extend our lifespan, we've done zip to extend our peak brain years. And so they're stuck right now in our 20s and 30s. So we're living most of our life with our brain in a state of decline, losing speed of connectivity, brain blood flow. But you don't have to. And we didn't realize that. So that's really what we're trying to get people to realize is say, hey, take this amazing engine inside your head, learn how to use it, and make sure that you can make sure that as we live an extended life, that we've got our fuller brain capacity with us. And we want to count on everybody, not just a few elite people that could come down to specialty centers. That's why, as uh, Jeff said, we don't want it to just be you know, that you have to come to a special place, but it's available in your app. It's available wherever you are because we want to reach people in the trenches so that they can see what is the possibility, really stretch the limits on it. 
um, you know, I, I don't even think we've begun to see how far, how fast our brain can be. And for me, you know, if you think about innovative thinking right now, most of the studies on innovative thinking stop. Guess what age? Elementary school. That sucks. I mean, <laughs> our brain was really wired to be innovative for the rest of our lives. And we've shown innovative thinking improve whether you're in your 20s, 40s, or 80s equally when people begin to embrace it. And it makes the brain change in very rapid ways. So, you know, that's really what we're, we want to do is for people to be inspired to be the architect of their own brain and not think, oh, brain, I'm just going to not get sleep, be constantly distracted, do overwhelmed by information, throw trash at you, and then go to the doctor and fix it. No, you are the one that is going to be drive this engine to make it healthier. So you, it's the most precious and greatest engine we have. We just need to know how to use it better. Chris, I want to point out one thing to, to most of your listeners, in fact, probably all of them, do something for their heart. They really do. I mean, I would argue that I would bet you that the vast majority of those who listen to your, uh, in your, of your followers will do something. They'll exercise every day. They may walk at the mall. They may, they, may, uh, they may ride a bike or whatever. They do this. They do this. And if you ask them what is uh, 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 critical elements of health, they'll tell it to you. You know, I got to watch my weight. You know, I've got to eat a, lot, a little less fat and sugar and this kind of stuff, eat a little bit more veggies. They already know how to do this. All that Sandy and I are advocating is there's a couple more things you can add to your daily routine that you already do that's going to benefit your brain, right? Because you're already doing stuff to benefit your cardiovascular health. Now we just need to add a few more things that are going to benefit your brain. Simple mm -hmm. things, get enough sleep. Simple things, reduce your stressors. Simple things, get out and do some social networking. These are all super simple things, but if they become part of your daily routine, like your walk, get your 10,000 steps. Everybody knows about 10,000 steps. It's on your watch, for goodness sakes. <laughs> we should have these type of things for your brain, and that's what Sandy's talking about. It's nothing. You don't have to go to a gym. You don't have to go to a gym. You may want to. Great. God bless you. But you don't have to. That's the point, Chris. So Sandy, you and I met three or four years ago when I started getting involved in the veteran mental health space through some nonprofit work. And then you introduced me to Dr. Ling in the beginning of COVID. But what brought the three of us together today was something I tripped across while Googling a month or so ago on, on mental health. And that's the White House Brain Capital Council, which you two both have helped to co-author. I know it's just a, a concept, but could you tell our listeners what it's about? Yeah, so the it is a proposal that... And I think COVID really laid bare that we are in a brain health crisis. And right now, every way that we approach brain is from a siloed, fragmented. There's a lot of agencies that have some piece of something related to brain, but nothing that really synergistically ties these different forces together. And the only way we now are moving into a brain economy the way that we're going to be able to learn to thrive, given the divisiveness, uh, the social isolation that's happening, the brain fog, the severe depression of people losing their jobs, losing loved ones, is really a concerted effort to move this ship to say, hey, let's move the economy through a brain capital to focus on the brain skills of every single individual to solve climate change you know, political things, how do we get along? So that's really what this is all about is how do we come together to bring hope and change in a very dramatic short-term way? And that's what this White House uh, brain capital is all about. We are moving into a brain economy. It's time. Brain, let's go. Dr. You know, Lang, Chris, good? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there was a, um, again, it's modeled on something that was very successful. Uh, you're too, uh, you and Sandy are too young to remember this, but I remember it. It was something that President Kennedy called uh, the National Fitness Program. And, um, and there was a fitness council that President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, convened. And it was really to, to embrace this council. It was coming out of the Framingham study, right? And it was getting young people to embrace fitness and the concept that it would spill over and include the entire populace. And, and in fact, it was highly successful, highly successful because they all recognize that good 
fitness meant reduction of the burden of diseases and longevity and all that other good stuff. What Sandy and I are trying to grasp is that same concept, that in fact, a brain capital, a council is just that. Who would be made up of it? Stakeholders. Stakeholders. Not just the AARP, the American Association of Retired People, but also the um, you know, uh, elementary school teachers. Um, it, it's really a, a, a throughout the society that, in fact, grabbing this concept of good brain health is, is, is across the spectra. And why is that important, Chris? Is because how did they get the message out? How did President Kennedy get the message out? How did the, the, these cardiovascular researchers, these nerds like Sand and me, get the message out? Because they actually started working with the end user, with the lay community, with the listeners, with the average Joe and Jane on the street. And so the American Heart Association, God bless them, embraced this concept. And they were uh, the ones who brought out this heart healthy program of which we just talked about. We need to do similar things because as Sandy points out, the solution to the myriad of problems we have is real simple. We're gonna have to think our way out of it. We're not gonna fight our way out of it. We're not gonna lift a heavy brick out to get our way out of it. We're gonna have to think our way out of it. It is really simple. And America is great for that. America is the innovators. Who came up with the internet? America. You know, who came up with the airplane? America. Who came up with the telephone that hangs on your hip? America. Where does Apple live? America. Where does, you know, um, Microsoft live? America. These are all things that were thought of. It wasn't because we were the biggest, strongest, baddest country. It's because we innovated. We thought our way out of problems. The problems that we talk about are not little. Climate change is not a little thing. It's a big thing. The troubles in the Eastern Europe right now is not a little thing. It's a big thing. So when you think about these problems, you're going to have to think your way out of it. It's really simple. We've been talking about brain health for ages 10 to 100. Let's talk about kids. Students from elementary school to college have had to deal with rapid change during the pandemic. How's the pandemic affected their brain health short-term and long-term? Sandy, you want to go first? Oh, yeah, I would love to. You know, for me, Chris, you know, a lot of people, when they think about brain health, they wait to think about, oh, I don't have to worry about that until I'm 60 or 65. But as we've looked and worked with so many youth, the people I'm the most worried about are our teenagers, um, you know, starting at age 10, but going through emerging adults, because the world as they know it, they've lost academic years, they've lost peer, I mean, the social, emotional growth that comes from, you know, learning how to be part of a team and, uh, you know, things as such. So it's it's been a really tough time and parents and uh, you know, having to figure out how do I educate kids? And can you imagine learning everything from just being downloaded information and not interacting? Everything about what makes learning fun has been really kind of stripped from them. So it's it's been a hard time. Um, but what I'm most excited about is not the despair that everyone focuses on, but it's just we have been able to show by teaching parents and teachers, how to teach kids just to be innovative versus fact regurgitators. They, we have been able to double their academic performance in science, math, history, and English. We've been able to intercept mental health disorders when they learn confidence and what's going on. So it's, it's not just about diagnosing the problem and say, Ooh, let's get bad. Everything's the more we diagnose the problems, we make them victims versus how can we empower them uh, realizing that they are suffering, but let's take advantage of the neuroplasticity of what can go on and it doesn't take so much. So yes, I'm worried. We need to be very proactive about it, um, but I cannot tell you how hopeful I am um, if we will put it forefront to everything that we're doing. Jeff, let's talk about a group that falls in the middle of those tens and centenarians. What should someone in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s be thinking about and doing now to be brain healthy for life in the same way that doctors preach about us being heart healthy? I think number one is awareness. That in mm -hmm. fact, you're never too young to start uh, 
good brain health habits, just like you're not too young to start a good cardiovascular health habits. And in fact, those health habits will actually have a long-term impact. Um, if we use something that uh, everybody understands, which is the heart healthy thing, if you don't start exercising now, when are you going to start? Uh, if you don't start to maintain your, uh, your weight, when are you going to start? And so, and when you, when, and when are you going to stop good, eat, start good eating habits? When are you going to start? And the same thing with the brain. When are you going to start good sleep habits? When are you going to start uh, reducing uh, multitasking, for example, which is, we know is an, is, has a negative impact on brain health. When are you going to uh, start, in fact, um, uh, smart training? When are you going to start to, do, to embrace um, redu reduction of stress? Uh, these are the kind of things that you can do in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s that will actually have a long-term impact. We all know that it's much better to prevent something, right, than to actually to treat something. So if, in fact, we start to embrace these uh, good brain health habits and in fact make them a habit as early as we possibly can, the long-term benefit will be totally realized. And that's really what we're trying to advocate right now is to start to embrace those things and make them part of your life. And many folks in those middle years, especially active duty, active duty military and veterans, uh, first responders, they're coping with post-traumatic stress. How does post-traumatic stress change brain physiology and function? And can the effects on brain physiology and function be reversed? Well, the short answer is the mechanistically, how do, do we know what actually happens at the cellular level with PTS? We don't, we don't. Uh, we do know that there is dysfunction, but if you said, is it an absence of function at the serotonergic level? Is it an absence uh, at the adrenergic level? Does it mean that your amygdala doesn't work anymore? These are all fancy medical terms that Sandy and I banter about. But the reality is I cannot say that you have a lesion or a disruption in your amygdala. I cannot tell you that. I can surmise that there's certain brain areas that are not functioning well. I can surmise that certain medicines that act on these different areas, like serotonergic agents and so on and so forth, uh, would in fact uh, be beneficial to some of the patients who have PTS, but not all. So it's a bit of a heterogeneity to it. And so I think it doesn't, right now, the science is still evolving. Let's put it that way. But are there things that those who suffer from these disorders, can they do to actually um, one, provide resilience to avoid having, it, uh, having them to begin with, and second, to be beneficial if they have it? And the short answer is yes. Again, it comes back to good brain health. I mean, there's, there's some things that, that, uh, that are going to be like, it, it, you know what, I know, I, I know you say to yourself, oh, gee, doc, don't you have a pill? I mean, don't you have a surgery? I point out to you that our friends, the cardiologists, cannot cure you of a heart attack. God forbid you should actually have that terrible heart attack. Are they going to give you a pill that's going to cure that heart attack? By golly, no. Are they, is a surgeon going to swoop in and do something to help that dead heart tissue? No. What they're going to do is they're going to have you institute good cardiovascular health. That's all the stuff we talked about. So you don't have a second heart attack. The same thing here. You've, you have gotten a stroke. Bad news, I can't give you a pill that's going to fix your stroke. I just can't. But I push back on the, my friends, the cardiologists, and say, What's, where's your pill? They don't have one either. It comes back to what are the good brain health things that you can do following a stroke or PTS or any number of, of other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Chris, I uh, would, we've worked with a lot of military, as you know, you know, when you first came down probably close to 6,000 now, uh, many of them with multiple concussions, PTSD. And when we began to work with them, we just wanted to improve their reasoning and critical thinking. And we've done a number of randomized trials. We actually had no idea that the training that we would do by helping um, them learn strategies for big idea thinking and innovation and broader perspective taking versus focusing on what caused the PTSD, that it would significantly reduce it. And we found that indeed it did. And it was shocking to us. We didn't say this is a treatment for PTS or depression, but we found that the training reduced depression by more than 50% and the stress by more than 40%. But, and we did also find that the area of the brain that's associated with PTSD 
uh, the percunius is an area that looks like it has dysfunction, was an area that got healthier along with their improved well-being. And so many of the military said, you know, I have spent so much time with drugs, you know, I've got bags full of drugs to help my PTSD and the pain, but nothing has really changed. And when I took ownership of my brain to build capacity to realize that, hey, yes, this is who I am, but it doesn't have to define me. I, so that whole idea of post-traumatic growth is really what we show them was possible. And for us, that's exciting to say, not to ignore it and to act like it didn't happen, but how does it make you more? And to develop strategies every single day to make you uh, figure out things to move forward and not be stuck with the things that are ruminating in your head and causing the trauma. Because the more you focus on it, guess what? You're building those neural networks and making them stronger. So we want them to realize if you're architecting your brain, And how you think changes your brain, is that where you want to build this capacity? And so when they become aware of it, they're like, oh, I had no idea that I was actually increasing the stress by how I'm thinking of this, you know, being impaired versus, yes, it's happened and it's, I will embrace it, but I'm not going to be stuck there. And Sandy, how can people in your discipline address their mental health needs? not just diagnosing and prescribing, but by building capacity to change the brain's frontal networks in a non-siloed approach. Yeah, so Chris, one of the the things that we're doing through the project that I'm the most excited about is defining brain health from a holistic perspective as a higher category of health. So that when you improve brain health, you get a cascade effect that it benefits mental health. You get a cascade effect on your social connection. You get a cascade effect to benefit the way that you're reasoning and solving the problems that are going on. So by proving, improving this higher category of health without saying we're improving your mental health, go get a diagnosis. I think that's something that surprised me as we look at this holistic index that individuals, when they improve, for example, their resilience, their social connection, we get a spillover effect to their improved mental health. Not by saying, oh, you're depressed, here's a drug, but yes, you're depressed. I wonder how your human to human connection is, or are you driven by purpose, which builds resilience? When you build that from a holistic perspective to make you thrive, we see it spill over to improve my overall, hey, you know, yeah, life is tough, but I can make it. I can weather this storm. I don't have to be so depressed or stressed because I've got a safety net of friends that I can rely on. I've got a purpose that's going to drive me. Or I've got day-to-day some compassion to someone that I can show that will pull me out of this. So it's seeing how our brain works holistically to work together versus this fragmented, siloed approach that really hasn't worked. We are diagnosing mental health disorders more and more, treating them more and more, and it's not going down. It's broken. We've got to approach it from, yes, get the help you need, but you probably need both and. You may need diagnosis medicine, but you've got to learn the tactical strategies to build capacity so that you can move forward in all of this holistic way. And it's exciting. You know, the college students, I could share with you cases. In fact, we just worked with a college student uh, this last week that was 21 that said, I, I, they were wicked smart, but really stress, anxiety, depression, the measures were way low. Um, And they said, I just can't get myself out of it. And they realized that they had not because they were smart, they thought I can just, you know, just keep studying, but studying got boring. So they began to work on their, again, kind of their friendships that had been lost because of COVID and driven by purpose. All of a sudden their mental health got better and their studies got better and their sleep got better. And they're like, I just didn't realize it was what I was doing that was making me depressed. I thought it was the environment around me that was causing it. So I was looking for 
reasons, but not within myself. Jeff, Sanyus mentioned sleep and compassion. How are sleep and compassion connected to brain health? And what happens to people who do not get enough of both? Again, we're still talking about brain health. I want to be very clear on this, all right? So sleep and compassion are very important elements to maintaining good brain health. And I, and, and I think that um, what you're asking is, is if you don't get enough sleep, does it have a negative impact on brain health? Yes, of course. That's, that's, it's kind of the flip of what we had just said. If, you're, if compassion, it, it, there's a lot of elements to compassion and it has to do with emotional content and a number of other things, but they all play into maintenance of good brain health. So in this discussion, it, we, we tend to go back and forth between pathology, brain diseases, depression, schizophrenia, autism, stroke, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and brain health, but mean good brain health. I want to be clear here that what we're really the focus shouldn't be that blurring between the two. We're really talking about brain health. How can you maintain good brain health? Treating these diseases is a very serious undertaking. If a patient has severe depression, severe depression, they should see a, med- a, a health professional. If a patient's had a stroke, by golly, they should see a health professional, right? This is not about how can I avoid seeing a health professional if something bad is happening to me you absolutely positively must see a qualified health professional for whatever ailment you may have. What we're talking about is empowering individuals to maintain good brain health, to maintain good health so as to avoid that going, uh, uh, necessarily going to see a, a, a health professional for pathology. We want to, that's what we're talking about. So as an example, when, she, when um, Sandy was talking about her college students, if I can equate it a different way, the student here feels like I can't, you know, Chris, I, I love baseball, but I, you know, man, I am, I am not making it to first base like I did when I was in high school. And the first thing you would do as a coach is say, run the 40 for me, run the 40 for me. And dude, you are not running the 40 like you did in high school. What up? Well, you know, I stay up late at night now. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking beer more. You know, I'm eating pretzels instead of eating food because my mama's not here. Then you would say, dude, start eating healthy. Start getting your sleep and get to run your 40 in 3.5 or less. And now they start now focusing not on, oh, do I, did I have a stroke and I'm dragging my leg? They really, they allowed their physical health to deteriorate and that impacted their function and their quality of life. They weren't sick in the strictest sense, but they were not performing at the healthy level they wanted to. What Sandy and I are advocating now is there are things you can do to maintain your brain health. So you can function at the level that you really is meaningful to you, is meaningful to you. That's really what we're talking about. Getting enough sleep, being compassionate, having the social networks. Will that get you to a place that your brain health is at a place that's meaningful to you, that you can perform in your in your college activities? Can you perform as a nationally syndicated podcaster and so on and so forth? These are the things that we're talking about. So I don't want us to get to fall into this notion of, oh, this person's depressed, therefore they don't need pills, they need brain health. Brain health is part of that solution. But people of pathology, get thee to a doctor. Get thee to a, if you have a brain tumor, I am sorry. All the sleep roll ain't gonna help you. You better get that thing out of your head. So I'm just saying. Great medical advice, thanks doctor. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Chris, what is the thing? I just want to add to that because, you know, in this day and age, people are always looking for a quick fix of, you know, well, can I just go do Sudoku or crossword puzzles? And what I say, yeah, it'll make you better crossword puzzles and Sudoku. Um, You know, so you really want to think about how you're using your brain energy. But if you really want to do something that Bill uses all of your brain and uses your problem solving skills go do an act of compassion with someone you disagree with. It actually causes you to not only zoom in to what you believe and and listen to what they're saying, but it makes you zoom out to a broader perspective and then zoom deep and wide to think about how can we find common ground here? So compassion, truly being able to do an act of compassion. We try to get people to do 
three to four acts of compassion, both with someone that's easy and someone that's kind of one of those girl, you know, you're going to get under my skin. I want to connect with you and show an act of compassion. It uses your brain skills in very dramatic ways. And probably it not only changes your neuropharmacy, but it changes the person that you've done an act of compassion with as well. So you both get this bi-directional benefit. Sticking with that neuropharmacy, can we use neuropharmacy to avoid pharmaceuticals? Is that even realistic? Is that where the compassion comes in? Again, this is about maintaining good brain health, right? So if in fact a person needs a pharmacologic intervention, they have epilepsy, they need to be on an anti-epileptic. Got it. You need to be on your anti-epileptic, but it doesn't mean that you don't that does not mean that you can't also have good brain health. Do the things that we're talking about. So in addition to your epilepsy, which you need your medicines for, and you're gonna need your medicines at whatever level it is. I mean, if you're on valproate, you better have a blood level between 50 and 100. That's not gonna change. But what you wanna do is have good brain health on top of that, so that even though you have epilepsy, you still are functioning at the level that you really want to be at. And that is what we're talking about. So they go hand in hand, but they're not necessarily, you know, ex uh, exclusive of the other. Um, there are elements, certainly, of people who feel that they they don't, they're at a state where they don't have good brain health, and they look to these quick fixes, as Sandy is pointing out. And that is not necessary. You don't need then the quick fix. You don't need to take that, that slug of alcohol, for example, right? Seriously, to calm my nerves. You don't need that. If you had good brain health, you don't need that slug of alcohol to calm your nerves. Your nerves will be just fine, thank you very much. And you'll be able to function just fine, thank you very much. That's really what we're, we're talking about. Getting, empowering you, the individual, so that the things that you do will give you the good brain health that you are expecting and want, really, so that you can do wonderful things and these compassionate things, solve these big problems that our world needs you to, survive, to solve, solve these little problems in your own household that you need to solve. All those things come with good brain health so that you don't need that slug of alcohol to calm your nerves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting. We're just now beginning to even look at how you can test, you know, are you changing your neuropharmacy and what our other co-leader, uh, Dr. Ian Robertson does a lot of work on dopamine and norepinephrine and has shown that, you know, just having people there self-talk, one of our greatest enemies is your own voice inside you. You know, if I say, I can't do that, it can't happen, then you change your neuropharmacy to be very depleting in terms of your energy level and the norepinephrine. But if you say, Chris, I can do this interview and it's going to happen. Then all of a sudden, I definitely get a ping of dopamine, which is kind of my brain's energy. So there are things we can do to downregulate the negative uh, neurotransmitters, as well as get the right amount of dopamine. And, you know, I know, um, you know, compassion is one of those things that changes your brain in very dramatic ways, oxytocin, uh, you get more of it when you show an act of compassion, as well as the individual you show it to, which is sort of this bonding. We all want, I mean, if you were to say we are humans, we are made to be connected. And it's one of the most powerful things you can do, maybe more important than being, well, not maybe, it is more important than being book smart is caring about humanity and being good at caring about people. And it changes your brain's neuropharmacy. You can't get that out of a bottle. We have just a few minutes left. Researchers and doctors have made great advances over the last five years. What advancements do you see in the next five, 10 years and beyond? And how those advancements change lives? I'll take it first. So I'm so excited, Chris. I'm hoping when you come visit us in a year, or at least within two years, just imagine that um, you could see your brain and all the, this brain gain from your brain health index and walk inside a virtual brain of Chris Meek and seeing, oh, there's my brain blood flow and the speed of connectivity and seeing this area. I think some of the thing, and this is kind of 
a little bit exaggerated, but I we already can show people's brain using EEG, fMRI. I think that when people can begin to visualize what is it that's happening when my brain's getting better from a cognitive perspective, but also the neuromarkers of a brain getting better, it's going to be really empowering for people to change the stigma of the black box that nothing can be done and say, you know what, brain, whether I'm whatever age I am next year, it's going to be better. Let's do everything we can to make sure that happens. Dr. Ling, 60 seconds. Yeah. I mean, it's a very exciting time. Uh, The uh, forward progress of technology, the forward progress of the sciences, the basic scientists is going to inform a lot of what Sandy and I are talking about. We need them to pivot them towards the idea of what it is to maintain good brain health versus pathology, all right? And once we understand those critical elements of that from a scientific standpoint, using the technology that's emerging, using the knowledge emerging, we'll actually be able to become much more defined in terms of what is your brain health index, right? Where are you on this spectrum? How can I improve it? Those are the things that are going to make where the power of this is going to going to be available to each person to then become, as Sandy puts it, the architect of their own good brain health. Dr. Sandra Chapman and Dr. Jeff Ling have been our guests today. You can learn more about them at centerforbrainhealth.com. Sandy and Jeff, thanks so much for your time. It was great seeing both of you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I'm Chris Meek. This is Next Steps Forward. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Until then, keep taking your next steps forward.